when I'm thinking about how we might reform marriage, I start by wondering if it's actually a choice that we make at all, or something that is instilled so deeply into us all as an idea that marriage is what we want, that we don't know how to think about it. And as a writer, I'm always looking at what we take for granted and asking why. And I'm also wondering about what we call tradition, you know, the way things are done. Now, people are still getting married. In fact, marriage is on the rise. And apparently, that's what happens in times of economic insecurity. <laughs> but the average UK marriage lasts just over 11 years. Anybody here been married more than 11 years? <laughs> oh, Wales, Wales! <laughs> I love you. And 43% of UK marriages presently end in divorce. So anybody who's got past the 11 years, you know, you're already beating the statistics, so that's pretty good. Now, Jane Austen liked to end her novels with a marriage, although she herself never married. But of course, she did live right through the Napoleonic Wars without ever writing about them once. No. <laughs> I mean, the, the function of soldiers in a Jane Austen novel is to look cute at parties, but never mind that. <laughs> so, she herself never married, but if I got the grammar wrong and said, although she never married herself, we'd now be discussing this new phenomenon of I, me, wed. Have you seen this? Yeah, you go on the websites, it's how to marry yourself, okay? And it's called sologamy. <laughs> Yes, it is. There are websites where you can practice sologamy. Now, I don't know if sologamy comes with a free vibrator, <laughs> but it's not legally binding. So the great thing about sologamy, if you, if you find you're having irreconcilable differences <laughs> with yourself, you can go your separate ways, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so if you are sologamous. It sounds like a little furry creature, doesn't it? Oh, look, there's a sologamous going over there. <laughs> Is anybody here sologamous? Has anybody married themselves here in Wales? Oh, well, that's coming to you. But if you are sologamous, then you've given up the idea of the other half. Yeah, which is really a Greek idea invented by Plato that male and female were once a whole, tragically split into two. And so we spend the rest of our lives looking for that missing other half. And Plato also thought that this could apply to men and men and women and women. What he didn't think ever was that your other half could be your marriage partner. Because the Greeks, and all of Western thought is based upon Greek thought, like it or not, the Greeks believed that women were inferior, nothing new about that. But why one half of the species has needed to declare itself superior to the other half of the species is a separate topic. But never mind. So boy love was the Greek ideal, an older man, a younger boy, and nobody thought there was anything odd about that. And even women who had money and power, like the poet Sappho living on Lesbos, openly celebrated their love of other women, their other half, their soulmate. For most women, though, in the Greek and later the Roman Empire, marriage was about children and about home. And it still is. Now, you can think about this as a law like gravity, something immutable and inevitable, because it's been going on for so long. Or you could think about it as nurture and not nature. Are girls hardwired to look for Mr. Right, to get married and to settle down? Or does everything on the planet condition them, us, to that role? And if conditioning doesn't work, coercion probably will. Forced marriages are still happening all over the world. And where they're not, economics plays a huge role. If you can't afford to be single, if you can't support yourself, you will have to marry. In the last decade in the UK, for the first time in history, the number of single women is greater than the number of married women. Women are choosing to remain single. And I would argue, because we can.
Yet, every magazine, every Mills and Boone love story, every air airplane rom-com is all out there to persuade us that our soulmate, our Mr. Right, is just round the corner. And after a series of trials, funny and sad, we will find ourselves with the perfect partner forever after. You know, there's form here, isn't there? Because fairy tales, especially the Disney versions, lean heavily on frog into prince, princess out of tower, glass slippers, true love's kiss. But at the same time, where do all those wicked stepmothers come from? Second marriages, of course. <laughs> Now, Shakespeare, Britain's top bard, mentioned in the same breath as the Bible, even by the Daily Mail, <laughs> was no poster boy for marriage. At 18, he had a shotgun wedding to the pregnant Anne Hathaway. She was 26, and they soon had a daughter, followed by twins. Four years later, Shakespeare left Stratford-on-Avon. He returned there once a year and bought substantial property there, but he didn't live with his wife again for the next 30 years. That was a hell of a business trip. <laughs> now, it's famously said that there are no happy marriages in Shakespeare, except for the Macbeths, because at least they talk to each other. <laughs> but is murder a good basis for marriage? <laughs> Wales, answer. So the biggest love story of them all, the, the motherfucker of all love stories, Romeo and Juliet, ends in death, not marriage. Brutally casting light on patriarchal forced marriages, Juliet doesn't want to marry Paris for family reasons. She wants to marry Romeo for love and sex, or well, probably sex and love. Because in Shakespeare, women are allowed to have sexual desire without being bunny boilers. <laughs> but love. Shakespeare's great theme is the fate of love. Radical at that time when marriage and love were separate, both in theory and in practice. The wealthy made dynastic marriages, the merchant classes made business arrangements, and the poor did what the poor always do, whatever they could. But love and marriage have been conspicuously apart for most of the history of marriage. Think about Wuthering Heights, after Romeo and Juliet, supposedly the most famous love story that we all know about a passion so great that it outruns death. In fact, Wuthering Heights is a story about property, about class, about power, and about the position of women. Look at how Heathcliff manipulates marriage to ruin his enemies. Cathy can't choose to love, she's a woman, and men choose for her, so she takes the usual route and chooses death like Madame Bovary, or Turandot, or Violetta in La Traviata. And in Jane Eyre, which is really Wuthering Heights for depressives... <laughs> it is. Economic realities are just as stark. If you don't marry, you'll end up as a penniless governess looking after other people's disgusting children. <laughs> or you'll have to do missionary work and have sex with all your clothes on. There is no white wedding in Jane Eyre. In fact, the white wedding is a Victorian invention. Victoria was the first person ever to wear a one-off white dress that couldn't be used again. The long-suffering wife, the fallen woman, are both Victorian typecasts. Now, we don't talk about women who have sex outside of marriage as fallen anymore. But we still have double standards. You know, the slut and the stud, the one who sows his wild oats, the one who can't control herself. We, we know what we're talking about here. In spite of that, we still believe, hope, somewhere, that the white wedding and the wedding vows and the happy ever after will solve it all. And it's what we want or what we should want. But marriage is too important, too embedded, for any of us to take for granted. The fuss about civil partnerships and lately equal marriage has brought marriage into the news in a way that I think is wholly good. Is marriage still to be defined as the lifelong union between a man and a woman? Uh, well, no. 